Bell, Louisiana. I'm Chef John Foles welcoming you to this great state of ours. These beautiful plantation homes reflect the fascinating history of our culture and cuisine, and I'd like to share this story with you. Why not join me and some of my friends as we visit the plantation homes of our state and cook up another great taste of Louisiana. Funding for this program was provided in part by Bruce Foods Corporation, makers of Louisiana Gold and other distinctive Louisiana-style food products. Additional funding is provided by the Louisiana Department of Culture, Recreation, and Tourism. Gumbo, Etouffee, Jambalaya, Beignet. Come pass a good time in Louisiana and say things you've never seen before. Whenever I consider the ingredients necessary for a perfect picnic, a couple of things come to mind. First, you need great food, and then a couple of friends to enjoy it with, and of course, beautiful surroundings. And if you're lucky enough to live in Louisiana, you may even find a 300-year-old live oak to spread your blanket under. I'm Chef John Fultz. Welcome to the most beautiful picnic spot in America, Oak Alley Plantation. One of the greatest mysteries surrounding any plantation home in Louisiana is who planted these oaks. We know that in 1836, Jacques Roman, one of the brothers of a governor of Louisiana, built this beautiful mansion at the end of the alley and named it Bon Séjour. That means good rest. And imagine the rest that you could get in this beautiful plantation home, the Pink Palace, as it was called. When we go into the bedrooms, we kind of wonder about that good rest because here Sandra Schechsneider is giving me a little demonstration on how to flatten the lumps out of that moss mattress with a rolling pin from a rolling pin bed. These beds came out of the Ursuline convent, and after the work is done, you can put it away right on the headboard of the bed. It becomes almost ornamental. This is another bedroom. Look at that mosquito netting right over the top to give you a little more comfort at night. And this is the beautiful, beautiful dining room at O'Galley. Sandra gave me a little insight into where the trees came from. Sandra, this is without a doubt the most beautiful entranceway to any home in America. How did these oak trees get here anyway? Well, it's thanks to church records. We know it's a French settler, came around 1690, built a log cabin. And he decided he wanted a personal passageway to the river, so he chose oak trees, and he took 28 little oaks, and he divided them in half, 14 on each side, and made his passageway. Mm -hmm. That way, the boats traveling the river would maybe see his little log cabin and stop to buy a fur or two. But the French settler didn't like our climate, didn't like the mosquitoes that we have here, and he left. But his log cabin fell, his trees grew. And today, they're over 300 years old, and we hope they last maybe to another 300 years. It's just beautiful, the alleyway here. It really is. It's magnificent. We sure hope they last another 300 years too, Sandra, because what a great gift from Oak Alley to the world. However, we do get a little afraid every time hurricanes come through because you can imagine what a loss this would be. There's lightning rods that go from the top of the tree all the way into the ground to protect them during storms. There's another tree of a lot of importance here also, and that's the pecan tree. It was here in the early 1800s that a slave developed the soft-shell pecan right here at Oak Alley, and that's an important find because we use pecans in so much of our cooking. If you're wondering who changed the name of the house from Bon Séjour to Oak Alley, it was the riverboat pilots going up and down the river who started to recognize the alley and knew that it would be a good landmark on the river, so they changed the name. But it was in the 1920s that Mr. and Mrs. Andrew Stewart came from New Orleans and purchased a dilapidated house and restored it to its condition. Can you imagine that they bought that home, 11,000 acres of uh, land and about 12,000 square feet of house for $50,000. Today, it's worth about $5 million. What a find. Now, what did they cook in this beautiful mansion? Well, I found a couple of different dishes that I thought would be interesting to share with you today. You saw that little picnic scene that was going on. It was a great spot for a picnic. So I thought that it was possibly picnic foods that we ought to look at. 
the first one of the dishes that I want to share with you is a plantation chicken, and this chicken is going to be seasoned with garlic and rosemary. It's going to be a fried chicken, but without all of the batter. You can see in my little pan here, I have just a standard chicken that's cut into about eight different serving pieces. And what I'm going to do is season this chicken with a little touch of salt, whatever uh, amount you would like, some cracked black pepper, of course, some nice granulated garlic. I prefer this to the powdered uh, garlic. This is more of the grains. And then some of that Louisiana hot sauce. We'll go ahead and put the pepper sauce right onto it. And then you want to kind of mash all of this around a little bit to kind of flavor all of that chicken and get it well seasoned. And once the seasoning is on it, I like to allow this chicken to sit and marinate for a little while. I'll get this chicken off of my hands. Uh, the longer it sits and marinates, the better off it's going to be. I like to let it sit for about an hour or so, and it's going to really pick up a great flavor. So now that that's done, I would go ahead and pan fry it. I'm going to go ahead and bring this fire up a little bit. Now I've put just about a quarter of an inch of oil into the bottom of the skillet. And what I'm going to do is take the chicken, put it skin down right into the oil. Look at that. Listen to that sizzle. Uh, in there. And I'm going to put it all down into the pan here, and I want to lightly brown it on all sides. You notice that I'm not putting any flour or egg or milk batter onto the bird because I don't want a heavy coating, but I do want to get a nice brown look to it. So I allow this to fry, and let me get some of my garlic out of here. I'm going to use that for in just a second. I allow this to fry until the chicken is not only whited out, but at the same time, nice and brown. Uh, that'll take probably about 15 or 20 minutes or so, and you want to turn it occasionally to make sure that it doesn't get too dumb on one side. We want to keep that moistness down on the inside of the chicken, but you can see how quickly it's going to get whited out in that nice, hot, black iron skillet. Now, once it's done, and I've, I've got a pan that's already cooked, so I'm going to turn this fire off so we can get this pan out of the way. And I want you to see exactly what it looks like when it's fried. Take a look at that. You can see how pretty and golden brown that chicken is. It's been cooking here, as I said, for about 15 minutes. To continue to season it, what I would do, I would add some whole cloves of garlic. I want you to take a look at these cloves. I'm going to put the whole cloves in. I won't chop them. I won't actually sit here and mash them or run them through a mincer. I'm going to put them in whole because once garlic sautés in oil, it becomes very sweet. And it's almost like an apple. I like to compare it to an apple because once it's sautéed, it has that nice sweet flavor and it makes a wonderful accompaniment to this dish in addition to the seasoning. Of course, I'm going to add some fresh rosemary. You could put any herb that you like into this dish, but I'm going to tear some of the rosemary leaves down into it and it's going to start to pick up that great flavor. Now, the important thing here is you cover the pan, allow it to slowly cook for about another 15 or 20 minutes. It's going to bake. This is a Dutch oven. So we're going to allow the chicken to bake on top of the stove to get that nice rosemary and garlic flavor. Once it's done, if you would like a little more gravy, this is going to be a sticky style of chicken. But if you want a little more gravy, you can add a little chicken stock or a little bit of uh, maybe even a touch of water or white wine, squeeze of lemon if you'd like, and you're going to have a really nice gravy in the bottom of a sticky chicken. Just about every culture on earth has a dish similar to this, but it's a great, great picnic food in Louisiana. And I want to show you exactly what this looks like once it's all plated up. Let me take the fires off of there so that we don't get too hot. And look at this bowl of chicken. How would you like to have this sitting on your picnic table? Look at the cloves of garlic, nice and golden brown. Of course, you can garnish it with heads of garlic here. There's the rosemary and all of that great chicken. Serve it on a couple napkins to pick up the excess oil that may drip off of the chicken, and it's going to be just a fantastic picnic dish. I just love this uh, garlic and rosemary fried chicken. Wonderful. The next dish that I found at Oak Alley as I was rummaging through some of those old books is that uh, I started to look at a lot of the other dishes that were easy to make, but yet something that would go very, very well on a picnic. And I started to look at the different salads that were available then. Then, of course, being in a subtropical type climate, 
we had a lot of vegetable gardens. And in vegetable gardens, you can imagine how much of a variety of everything we had. Well, one of the dishes that I came across that I was really impressed with, not only because of the color, but because I love carrots, is a carrot and shrimp salad. It's so easy to make, but then when it comes together on a bowl, you can imagine what it's going to look like sitting in the center of a big picnic blanket under those oak trees at Oak Alley. The way I begin this salad is I take some little bitty peeled and deveined shrimp. You can take a look at these and see these are about 100 to 200 count to the pound. That means that that's about how many shrimp will go into one pound once they're peeled. And of course, you can get these in any store all over the country, but substitute crab meat or scallops or anything else in this salad. It'll work very well. I'm using all of the typical flavorings of a salad. We have green onions chopped very fine egg white, egg yolk, because this always goes well in potato salad or in this carrot salad. And for color, since it is a picnic, we have some red bell pepper, golden, a little celery, all uncooked, because we want that crunchy flavor in the salad. And then, look at my carrots. I've taken them and I was careful to cut them all the same size. I actually used a potato peeler. and Just kind of peel the carrot from the top to the bottom to make sure that we would have a really nice, long, lean look to the carrot and then I sliced them. Once we did that, we poached them in a little bit lightly salted water for about, oh, 15, 20 minutes until the carrots were nice and tender. We were very careful not to overcook them, and then we're ready to make the salad. So we can put it all together this way. Now, I have a really bright bowl here. You know, I'm kind of crazy about bowls. Take a look at this thing. This is really nice checkerboard, and the orange color inside of the blue makes this perfect for a picnic. Look at that thing. You could just put it out on the blanket just the way it is. I've got about two and a half to three cups of carrots down into the bottom of this bowl, and I can put all of my ingredients right down into it now. I'll add the carrots that I already have, the yellow and red bell pepper and celery. Just kind of push it all in. Now, the yolk of the egg and the white of the egg I've chopped to make sure that it can mix well right into the mayonnaise and uh, mustard dressing. There's the greens, and then, of course, the cooked shrimp. And eliminate the seafood. If A lot of people don't like seafood in too many dishes, so just eliminate it if you don't like it. Uh, certainly in Louisiana, we wouldn't eliminate it, but now we're gonna mix all of this into that great big bowl. Look how pretty this is. Once that's done, I would go ahead and flavor it with all of the rest of my ingredients. I'm gonna put mayonnaise into it, and of course there's a lot of light mayonnaises on the market as well. You don't have to use the real rich, heavy, full of saturated fats mayonnaise. There's a lot of other light ones on the market. Here I'm using some regular mustard. That gives it that great yellow color. And then some Creole-style mustard. The Creole-style mustard is kind of a, I guess a German style. You can find a lot of these flavored mustards on the market, and just kind of put that down into it and a touch of vegetable oil. And once all of this is in, then you want to mix it up really good and try other variations on this salad. I'm using, of course, uh, carrots, but just think of beets. Think of some nice uh, sweet potatoes or yams that have been poached off and put into this salad. Look how pretty this is as it goes together. Now, to finish flavoring it, once you mix it, I would just put some of my traditional flavoring, salt, pepper, a little pepper sauce, of course, basil, thyme, any of those things. Let me go ahead and season it. Salt, pepper. Again, I can use some of that touch of granulated garlic if I'd like. And again, stir it all up. And then to plate it up, I could either serve it directly in this bowl if I wanted to, or look at this. Isn't this a beautiful big leaf of cabbage or lettuce or and it's garnished with the boiled shrimp, as you can see. So it's gonna make a pretty presentation on a picnic table, this wonderful carrot and shrimp salad. Look how nice that is. And once you get it all onto the bowl and get it arranged the way you want it to, of course, you could come back right on the top, as I'm gonna do now, and finish garnishing it with some of these pretty colors that I always like to keep right on the table. Here's some yellow bell pepper. Here's some red cabbage really nice red cabbage and just kind of put it on there. Look how pretty this is. Beautiful picnic dish. You can never find, in my opinion, anything better. Beautiful dish.
Okay, now what would I serve in addition to these two on the picnic table? Well, let's take a look at them. Here, I have a really nice platter of stuffed celery. What I've done, I've cut the celery in about two, two and a half inch pieces. I've stuffed it with a little bit egg and cream cheese and uh, some cheddar cheese, all just squeezed right into the celery. And then I've topped it with a little bit edible flowers, different colored flowers. It's great for a picnic table, obviously beautiful, and something that's very tasty, easy to make. And you might keep this as a snack in the refrigerator uh, at night at home. You don't have to go on a picnic. This is one of my favorites here. Take a look at this. Boy, couldn't you just dive right into this little plate? This is a plate of blackberry flavored jelly rolls. Not only do we have the jelly rolls just filled with the, uh, with the blackberry filling, but right in the center, fresh Louisiana blackberries. And you can get these just about all year long because they're grown in farms and you can get them out of hothouses and they're wonderful for garnishes. But of course, substitute any jelly or berry into uh, that jelly roll center, it's gonna be great. Well, you saw a couple minutes ago, I was walking around Oak Alley with Sandra Shexnot, and Sandra is the director of Oak Alley Plantation, and she's coming to visit with me today. Look how nice she looks. Oh, you Thank a big you, John. Hug here. <laughs> you look great. How's everything at Oak Alley? Everything's fine. It's very busy. How you like my picnic dishes? Huh? Is this oh. something we could do under the trees? Yes, it looks delicious. Well, look, hey, mm, we can, we gotta, we gotta eat some of this later. I love that carrot salad with my favorite. So it's jelly rolls, you can tell, right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> we love the jelly rolls. You know, when I was over at Oak Alley visiting with you the other day, mm -hmm. we were talking about that old-fashioned Louisiana iced tea. Remember the orange yes, iced tea? And we talked about the, the leaves with the, uh, or the mint leaves and the orange peel with the cloves of, uh, uh, stuck into it. I used to eat and drink that stuff when I had a sore throat as a, a young kid. Remember, we talked about that. And, I want to make a pot of it so they can get the recipe, and we're going to sip Good, some. Come on it. over here. Okay. What I have, I have my little red pot boiling here with about a quart of water in it. Okay. And here I have some nice peels of the orange, and we have the cloves all down, stuck into the, uh, uh, the orange peel. And that's going to give it a lot of great flavor. We can put that down into it. Lemon peel, of course, very refreshing for that sore throat. Mm -hmm. And as a, my grandmother used to pour this down my throat, and I'm sure the same thing happened y'all look at this little tea bags down into it and I would stir this around put a big sprig tea. yeah give right. a big sprig of that mint, mint back there that's, that's what there you go throw it right down into them we use that oak alley too you know uh, I know when y'all had that great big uh, cluster of mint right. on the top of every glass oh. and mint juleps yes <laughs> those things are potent huh <laughs> I would let this boil for about 10-15 minutes or so I have a picture of it right over here why don't we take a seat and get us a glass of this and Talk about some of the stories of Oak Alley. What a beautiful, beautiful place that is, huh? Thank How you. long have you been a guide over at Oak Alley? I was a guide for a year. And then uh, after that, I became manager and curator for, now it's three years. Right, so, so you're, the, you're the manager and director of Oak Alley Plantation. You're in charge of all the decision making out there. Uh, huh? hey, <laughs> that was a big house. Salute, as we say in South Louisiana. Good iced tea. Of all of the things very that good. you could do in South Louisiana, you live in a very interesting area. There's a lot of <laughs> industry going on in and around Vassar, where Oak Alley is uh, located. There's a lot of businesses there. Why would you choose the business of running a plantation home and giving tours and talking to people coming in from all over the world? You know, I just fell in love with that house for years. I traveled to River Road, and it sort of just pulled me. And then I just decided to try it, and I fell in love with it, you know. And I, so I'm glad I'm there. I'm glad I'm there. Do you have to live the part? You know, I see y'all in these gorgeous dresses, and <laughs> there's, there's so many girls and running around there, the guys with the long coats and top hats. And I think to myself, do people have to live the part of the old South to really be a good guy? Yes. Like I said, I love the house, but you have to also love the history and the story. People come and they, they want to reminisce about the old days, and you have to love it. You have to give them a story, and you go through the house and you talk about it, and it feels like home. It has to feel like home for you to give a good story and make people like it as much as you. You told me a story one day that I thought was very interesting about in the old days how times changed. The trees are out there in this big, beautiful alley, mm -hmm. and you were telling me about in the old days when 
young girls were protected, the mother and the daughters would ride. <laughs> Tell me about that. Well, in the old days, young ladies never went anywhere without their mom or their grandmother. And, you know, they had lots of secrets. So they would walk the alleyway and tell the secrets to their mom or their grandmother. Of course, today, things have changed a lot. The young ladies walk the alleyway with their bows. And a lot of girls have been engaged, have become engaged under our oak trees. Very special place. Well, you know, I can see how somebody not even thinking about getting married, walking under those <laughs> oaks and looking back at the right. house would get a little romantic spell. And yeah. it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful place. You have so many people coming from all over the world. Yes. Do, do you have to treat different people from different areas any differently from others? Do they all come to expect the same type of tour? Or do you have to uh, kind of tailor it to different groups? You know how we are, John. <laughs> Very open. We like to talk and we like to hug. Well, we've learned over the years that you greet people, you welcome them to Ocala, and then you sort of listen to them. Because some people sort of stand back from us because they think, Oh, my goodness, here she's going to hug me, <laughs> and which we are not. It's just that we're so open. And you learn that, you know, and we have foreigners, lots of foreigners that come by, and we learn that you don't ask if they're here for a tour. You have to ask if they're here for a visit. And so you learn over the years by different people, you know. You were telling me about some Spanish, yes. uh, a, a group of Spanish oh. tourists that came in one day, and a young guy, I thought that was such a great story. <laughs> well, that, tell me exactly, how, how did that go? What did he do? Okay. What happened that day was a group of people from Spain that were coming to the house, and they had to wait for a little while to go in. We had a, a young man on a, on a tractor cutting grass, and it was very warm that day. So he got off, and he was going for a drink of water, and all the young tour guides were sitting next to the house. So he walked up, and he said, hey, what's up? Well, all the people from Spain looked up. <laughs> <laughs> so I, right, I had to explain to them what that really meant. <laughs> of all of the things that ever happened at O'Galley, and I know there must be many, many memorable occasions that's taken place since you've been there. Mm -hmm. What's your most memorable? Oh, there are so many, really. Of course, my favorite was Frankie Avalon when he came up in a long stretch white limo, because, I mean, I was in love with him when I was 16. It sort of brought me <laughs> back to the 50s. Oh, I'm telling my age here. <laughs> also, I think uh, the wedding of Delta Burke and uh, Gerald McElhaney, that was real special. But you all the news people calling on the grounds, that was neat. Uh, a lot of commercials, especially a Japanese commercial, came with a drag line, parked it in the back of the house, and it was a construction company from Japan, and their commercial was, let me build this house for you. <laughs> <laughs> and all day they went around bowing, so at the end of the day, that's what we were doing, bowing <laughs> to each other. So, so many wonderful, it's so different every day. Wonderful. Well, what about the impact on the local community? Uh, uh, what impact do you think that house has? Well, a lot. And we hire a lot of local people, a lot of local girls. I like to hire the, the young high school girls and the college girls. It gives them a lot to, to learn, to be able to talk in front of people. We have the sugar cane fields that we lease out to local farmers. And, of course, then we raise the sugar cane, which is good for us. You know? So, sure. You know, I remember as a young boy, I grew up only about eight miles That's from right. the entrance of Oak Alley. I grew up on an <laughs> old sugar plantation. And so many times I drove in front of that place and thought to myself what it must have been like to live in that house at the end of that beautiful alley of oaks. What are some of the special events that you all have there every year? Well, the one that's very special to me is the Christmas bonfire party. We have it the second Saturday of every December, every year in December. And it's wonderful. We light a bonfire on the river, and we have lots of music, lots of food, lots of drinks, dancing. It's lots of fun. And it's a uh, fundraiser for the house. It helps us to repair something. So it's good. Everyone's well, invited to it. Well, you know, uh, the, se the second Saturday, you say, mm -hmm. of December, the bonfires are lit on the levee from New Orleans to Donaldsonville. That's right. And actually, people come from all over the world again right. just to see us light the bonfires and light the way for Santa Claus into yeah. uh, uh, One day I was on the levee there when the bonfires were lit, and I saw all of the paddle wheelers flashing their lights yes, on the levee. It was a that. very memorable occasion. Sandra, thank you so much for coming and sharing so those welcome. great Enjoy. stories with us today. And I want to invite all of you to come back again and visit as we cook up more of these great Taste of Louisiana. See you next time. Let's come taste some of these. Uh, oh, uh, uh,
Funding for this program was provided in part by Bruce Foods Corporation, makers of Bruce's Yams and other distinctive Louisiana-style food products. Additional funding is provided by the Louisiana Department of Culture, Recreation, and Tourism. Gumbo, Etouffee, Jambalaya, Beignet. Come pass a good time in Louisiana and say things you've never seen before. Chef John Fosa's Plantation Celebrations, Recipes from Our Louisiana Mansions, is a full-color 335-page book containing food history, recipes, and over 150 photographs from these southern landmarks. For your copy, send a check or money order for $28.50 to Louisiana Public Broadcasting, 7860 and Selmo Lane, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, 70810. Or use your credit card by calling toll-free 1-800-973-7246.